What's so important? What you got here, that's worth living for. <laughs> There's a movie that'll never get old. Am I right? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, um, we acknowledge your presence in this place. And we want to hear what you have to say to us. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Hold the thought on Princess Bride. What is it that fascinates us so much about superheroes? Everything about that, ever, ever since, you know, uh, Homer and his Iliad or Beowulf or the middle centuries and their knights or the old west and the cowboys, every culture, every generation has its superheroes that they admire. During wartime, superheroes are often soldiers like Sergeant York or Audie Murphy. Um, any Marines among us today? Any Marines? Uh, thank you for your service. Um, my face, yeah. Um, my favorite, I think my favorite museum in the Washington area is the Marine Corps Museum. When you go to the Marine Corps Museum, one of the first things you see featured is the Battle of Bella Wood from World War I. Sergeant Major Dan Daly yells at his boys, come on boys, except he doesn't use that language, he uses marine talk. He says, come on boys, he says, do you want to live forever? Heroes have something to live for. And that company charged the Germans in one of the great victories in Marine Corps history. More recently, comic heroes have grabbed the stage. Every year it seems there are new movies, not just one or two, but multiple movies that are coming out about superheroes. Sometimes there are new superheroes that seem to be created. There's Captain America and Iron Man and Superman and Superwoman and Spider-Man and Wonder Woman. And I saw something last night for Black Adam. There's Storm and there's Steel. And then, of course, the greatest super. Hero of all, Tom Pounder. You, <laughs> you can take the boy out of student ministry, but you can't take student ministry out of the man. Anyway, what is it about these superheroes? From the beginning of time to the end of time, superheroes capture the imagination. Could it be possibly, at least part of it is, that they have something to live for? They come and they save the day. Or sometimes they come on the scene and save the world. And there's part of us that really wants to have something important worth living for. What you got important worth living for? If we don't have something worth living for, we will create something lesser. Maybe it's the weekend that we live for or the next video game or the next concert or the next accomplishment or the next buzz or the next vacation or the next thrill, the next escape. I read adolescent recently, descri adolescence described as a time to live, to experience, to love before the monotony of adulthood takes over. And today, increasing numbers of 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds get stuck in adolescence, afraid of the monotony of adulthood. They want something to live for, and they're afraid that adolescence is the best you get. Voltaire, the 18th century philosopher, once said, I've lived 80 years and know nothing for it, but to tell myself that flies are born to be eaten by spiders and man to be devoured by sorrow. Must have been a chipper guy to spend time with, <laughs> that Voltaire. Hunter Thompson is an icon to the counterculture, has been since the 60s. Perhaps best known for his book and the movie Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. At age 87, he took his own life. In his suicide note, he wrote these words. No more games, no more bombs, no more walking, no more fun, no more swimming, 67. That's 17 years past 50. 17 more than I needed or wanted. Boring, no fun for anybody. And today there are still many who give him great admiration. 
So I would ask you, what, what you got worth living for? What do you have that's worth everything to live for? The great missionary William Carey famously said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. I really do believe that there's nothing more important than what is done for the kingdom. It's the only thing that will last. I really am convinced that inside the, each of us beats the heart of one who's born for something more important worth living for. I want to be candid. Today's message is not for everybody. If you are a consumer Christian, you, the casual, con, content with casual Christianity, cultural Christianity, then you know, this is probably not the message for you. If you came here today hoping for a sermon on five practical steps to make coffee that blesses Jesus, if you're looking for, you know, three ways to increase your self-esteem and to love yourself better, this is not the message that you've come for. You're probably going to be disappointed. But if you want to know what's worth living for, if you love God with your heart, and your heart's great desire is that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm glad you're here. Second Chronicles 16 verse 9 says, The eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. From time to time, you see, God will step into history and he looks for a people in a generation that he can use to create a spiritual awakening, a great revival. From time to time, we see this as he moves. We've seen it in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see it in the first century. And there's a part of me that's like, oh, I wish I could have lived at the first century church to see God move in such dramatic ways. Or in the early centuries, or in the middle centuries with the great reformers, or in the 18th century when Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards are, are preaching and they're like thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming to Christ in the Great Awakening, out of which, by the way, the United States is born, sometimes called the, the, uh, the Presbyterian Constitution that we have, St. Corinthians 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth, looking for people who will put up their hands and say, God, do it again through me. Here I am. Send me. God is able. The Bible tells us that unless the Lord builds the house, those who work labor in vain. But he is always at work around us. He will build the house if we allow him to through us. What's the key? I want to suggest to you today that it's desperation. The question is, are we desperate enough? I've told you before that I grew up in northwestern Pennsylvania, farm country. My dad grew up on a farm. My dad used to say, you know who makes the best farmers? Hungry farmers. They're desperate to eat. You know who make the best followers of Jesus Christ, who have the greatest impact for God in this world? Hungry people. People who are hungry to see his kingdom come, his will be done. To see his glory. To see people know him. Martin Luther Jones wrote a book called Revival. He wrote it on the 100th anniversary of the Welsh Revolution. He wrote it in 1959, by the way, if that gives you perspective. He says, you know, people in the United States talk about a lot about the desire for revival. He says, Christians talk in, in the United States talk about it. But he says, I don't think they're serious. I was a little bit taken back by that. Who is this Brit to tell us? But, um, but he said, I don't think they're serious because he said, I don't think they're desperate enough. And I wonder if he's right. Reminds me of the story I've told you before, the true story of the Christian the Chinese minister who came to the United States so that he could learn from the largest churches in America. After touring the mega churches, some of the largest churches in America, his host was taking him back to the airport. And he asked him, so what surprised you? What did you learn about the, from the largest churches in America that surprised you the most? He said, what surprises me the most is how much they can accomplish without the power of God. 
That's kind of humbling. We are a people of education, not of God's power. We're a people of, of techniques and organization and plans and strategy and trust in our own abilities, much more than the power of God. Jeremiah 17, 5 reminds us, though, that those who trust in the arm of the flesh will fail. And so we're desperate for God's power. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What does desperation look like? If you want to see one picture of it, Mark chapter 9. Almost a comedic story. Jesus has just come off of the mountain where he appeared with where, where, where uh, M Moses and Elijah showed up, Peter, James, and John are with him. Now, they now come to the bottom of the mountain where there's a group of people meeting, and it's like this commotion going on. Jesus says, what's going on? It's kind of interesting. One of the disciples does not answer the question. Someone from the crowd answers him, a father. I think the disciples are too embarrassed. Teacher, I brought you my son, he has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus asked him, if you can, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And who in this place can't, rec can't connect with that father's statement? Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Jesus heals the boy, sends him away in his right mind. Now the disciples have a chance to ask Jesus their question alone. Verse 28, after they'd gone to the house, the disciple asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he told them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer. Other translations say, by prayer and fasting. Their desperation is palpable, is it not? They feel horrible for the dad. They hurt deeply for the boy. They're frustrated for the crowds. They're embarrassed for themselves. They've healed before, but this time there's no impact. They pray, and this time there's nothing. They are as frustrated. A friend of mine says they are as frustrated as a vegan lion. <laughs> as frustrated as a preacher without lips. Why were we powerless, they ask. Can you relate to their desperation? Like the boy in Mark 9, we live in a generation of people that are tossed about like Satan's rag dolls, don't we? You see it in the news every day. Americans today are more depressed and anxious than ever. Violence is increasing, crime is increasing, despair is increasing, families are divided. Anger oozes from every television show, not just the news shows, but even the comedy shows. They're so filled with anger. I read an article by, in PBS just last night that said Americans are the, uh, are the unhappiest they've been in 50 years. I found articles written from the left perspective and the right perspective saying America is falling apart. Kids don't know who they are anymore, and they have adults telling them, oh, but you're enough. You can figure it out for yourself at nine years old. Politicians don't know what a woman is anymore or what a man is anymore. We live in a generation that has lost its moral compass. You want to see demon possession? Watch Washington football this afternoon. You'll see <laughs> demon possession. Now, Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And if you love people, you're frustrated by the havoc that Satan is wreaking. It's not hard to find headlines that say the church is failing. Why is the church in the West 
failing. Like the disciples, we say, Jesus, why can't we make a difference? Once we identify with the disciples' desperation for Jesus' power, it then opens us up to take a look at the question, desperate for what? What do we need to be desperate for? I want to suggest to you that it's, first of all, repentance and confession that is driven by the holiness of God. When you read of the great awakenings, the great spiritual movements in history, what you see is that there is an inseparable link between the power of God and experiencing God's holiness, a passion for His holiness. God opposes the proud, the Bible tells us, but He gives grace to the humble. You want to be opposed to God? Be proud. And we are a proud t- generation. You want God's grace? Humble yourself. And what is it that humbles us to God's grace? It is His holiness. Every spiritual awakening in history is preceded by confession and repentance in God's people. J.C. Riley wrote of the great, the leaders of the great awakening in the 18th century, he wrote, they taught constantly the inseparable connection between true faith and personal holiness. We're not surprised by that. Um, David would write in Psalm 51, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. See, often people, you'll hear people talk about, oh, what we need is to pray more. When God brings revival, it's because people pray, it's because people pray what they, and, and this is one of the things that Martin Lloyd-Jones points out in his book. He says, what they fail to re- remember is before prayer can be effective, repentance must unclog the artery, arteries of the soul. Our confession of our own pride, our own half-heartedness, our own self-centeredness, our own friendship with sin. William Castle observed a great revival in China years ago. They saw literally hundreds of thousands, millions of people eventually brought to Christ. He observed of that revival. Revival means judgment day, he wrote. That's what happened in Shantung, China. Judgment on missionaries, pastors, people, And then fear fell on the world, and God's name was glorified. People have such a wrong idea of what revival means, he writes. They think revival is something triumphant, an overflowing of great blessing. It is, first, it is judgment day on the church. But after judgment, after things have settled, it's God's blessings abounding. Blessing will come Power will come, but first must come our confession. I don't know about you, but how many of you are desperate for judgment to begin with us? I'm not. I was reviewing that song from Mary Poppins, a few of my favorite things. You know, raindrops on roses, whiskers on kittens, bright kettle bright copper kettles and God's wrathful convictions just wasn't there. <laughs> but Peter said it in First Peter, <clears throat> fourth chapter, I think, is where he says, it's time for judgment to begin with the family of God. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the brokenhearted. Personal ambition, you see, just is not enough to bring about sweeping change. It's not, about, it's not enough to, to, to cause us to weep for lost people the way that Jesus wept for lost people. A desire for a bigger church or personal happiness, personal peace and prosperity, social justice agendas is not enough to sustain a powerful movement of God. Only God's holiness does that. Because when when we come to realize that God is holy, we realize every knee should bow. God is holy. His, his, His glory is great and is overwhelming. He is worthy that every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And if there's one knee that is not bowing to God, 
they're living underneath reality. They're living underneath their privilege. They're living beneath what God would have for them. And so what moves us to tears is realizing, first of all, the holiness of God means His grace is so amazing. Somebody noted that you never see a spiritual awakening among the Unitarians. See, the Unitarians don't believe anything. They don't believe in the holiness of God. They accept, there's no sense of morality, really, from God in them. You never find revival among people who are not committed to the truth and holiness of God. Powerful movements come when people realize it's judgment day for us. And it begins in this room. It begins with people like Isaiah in the Old Testament, that great hero. God is looking for a prophet. And he says, who can I send and who will go for me? And remember what Isaiah says? Isaiah says, here I am, send me, but I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. I am not holy, Lord. What is Isaiah most concerned with? His holiness and the holiness of God and God, and God takes care of his holiness first. And then he goes and he preaches. The Reformation movement. What was the Reformation movement except a repentance movement led by Luther and Calvin and others? Um, forever reforming was their motto. And so we pray, God, do it again in our generation James reminds us the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Martin Lloyd-Jones asks us, do you really want God's power? Are you serious about God's power? Are you, real, are you desperate for it? Then we first of all have to be desperate for His holiness, which drives us to confessions in rooms like this. When you read about those great revivals, even in this past century, those great revivals began in rooms like this where people moved by the Holy Spirit, not by hysterical preaching, not by some sociological event, but people moved by the Holy Spirit of God came under conviction of their sin and said, God, you are worthy of our best. You are Lord of all. All that matters is your name. And we want to live for you. 2 Chronicles 69, for the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong. He wants to for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. The psalmist writes, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry for help. It's time for judgment to begin with you and me. What do we need to repent of? Expect great things of God, attempt great things for God because God is great. God empowers us when we're desperate for him and his holiness. He empowers us when we're desperate for him and his power alone. If the first one is difficult, this one is ugh, even more so. The disciples are so frustrated. It's worked before, it's not working now. It's worked for, we've seen it, Lord. We've seen you. Why didn't our prayer work this time? Now, the good news is when they were frustrated, they went to Jesus in their desperation. They didn't run away from Jesus in their desperation. I would like to think of this moment as their Gideon moment. There's a wonderful story in the Old Testament of the Bible, true story, where God comes to Gideon, who's not the most courageous human being who's ever walked the face of the earth. But he says, Gideon, I want you to be my mighty warrior to lead my people against the Midianites. The Midianites have been oppressing my people long enough. It is time to put a stop to it. So Gideon raised up some troops. I'm going to have you lead them against the Midianites. And so Gideon does what any good warrior would do. He raises up a, 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 a group of soldiers, 30,000 strong. And he says, God, I'm ready to go. And God says, great, glad you're ready to go. 30,000 soldiers, bad idea. What do you mean bad idea? Gideon, if you go in with 30,000 soldiers to defeat the Midianites, who are people, what are people going to think? Are they going to have great confidence in me? No, they're going to have great confidence in your 30,000 soldiers. They're going to think, well, of course they won because we have great soldiers. We have a great army. We can trust in our army. Gideon, you're not going to go in with 30,000 soldiers. You're going to go with 300 soldiers. 
Because when you go in with 300 soldiers, then people will know it is not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit that, says that, it, that, that I gave the victory. My power gave the victory. Now, if you are Gideon in that moment and God says, you're going to attack the enemy with 300 soldiers, not 30,000, what is the word to describe your emotion? How about desperate? Lord, if you're not in this, I'm toast. God, there's no human way I can defeat them with 300 soldiers. Without your power, I lose. It's a lock. But when Gideon goes in with his 300 soldiers and their horns and breaking their pitchers, God is glorified. In fact, it's kind of interesting when Gideon listens the night before to what the enemies are saying, the Midianites are saying about, about the people of Israel. You know who they're afraid of? They're not afraid of Gideon and the soldiers and his army. They're afraid of Gideon's God. They understand that it's the God, that it's God who has power. I sometimes wonder if 2022 is Christianity's Gideon moment. Maybe it's New Life's Gideon moment. If there's ever been a time in history when we as a church have been able to rely on our own strength, it's now. We have flourished by relying on our 30,000 troops. We have more books and conferences and strategies and music and experts. We trust our buildings and our gifts and our brains and our financial plans. We've lived in the United States on a friendly, with a friendly home team advantage for 200 years. And now that's, disapp di di that, that's, that's disappearing and people are afraid. Like the disciples were saying, what's worked in the past isn't working now. What's worked for others isn't making a dent today. The desperation question asks, what 30,000 troops are you trusting to win your battles? God is saying to us, you want to trust your 30,000 troops to go against your Midianites? Fine. Trust your 30,000 troops. I'm just not going to be with you. You don't need me if you're going to trust your 30,000 troops. And he allows us to be frustrated until we turn to him and say, Lord, we need you. What would it look like for you to go into battle with God and 300 troops? With 300 troops weak, but God strong. For Billy Graham, it meant trusting the Bible completely. As a young man, Billy Graham and Charles Templeton were good friends. They were also known as the leading preachers, young preacher boys for Youth for Christ. In fact, while we recognize Billy Graham as probably the greatest preacher from America in the 20th century, Charles Templeton was the preacher who was the stronger of those two. But Templeton went to a liberal seminary got educated by people that taught him you can't trust the Bible. Historically not true. Can't, it's not accurate. That makes so many filled with mistakes and contradictions. And he started to influence Billy Graham. And Billy Graham's faith began to wane. And they say it began to affect his preaching. So much so that it came to the point where he was preaching a uh, in a sense, a revival service there in, in Altoona, Pennsylvania for the Youth for Christ. And it was a complete flop, powerless disaster. Billy Graham was so frustrated that he went to, um, he went to California. Now, the point of, isn't like if you get, um, I know nobody goes to California today if you're frustrated. It's like you go away from California if you're frustrated. But, in the, in the, but there was a place there. Henrietta Mears had a retreat center where he went and where he just dove into the Bible. He said he just kept reading the Bible day after day. And as he read it, one phrase jumped out at him. The one phrase was, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. That one phrase, he said he realized as he read scriptures, that he had accepted the truthfulness of scripture to a degree. 
that he had never really fully surrendered the weight of his heart and life to the trustworthiness of God and his word. That night he walked in the woods and he placed his Bible on an old tree stump and prayed, oh God, there are many things in this book that I do not understand, many problems for which I do not have answers. Then falling on his knees, he cried out, Father, I am going to accept your word by faith. I'm going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubts, and I will receive this as your inspired words. Billy Graham wrote in his autobiography, that moment changed his life. He stood up, feeling a power and presence of God in a way that he had never felt in months. A major bridge had been crossed. And Henrietta Mears, who heard him preach the next day, said he preached with an authority like she had never heard before. Have you ever heard Billy Graham preach in those old... I mean, honestly, I listen, I think, this guy is just so plain, so straightforward, so... And yet, hundreds of... And yet, worldwide impact, why? It is the power of God when we trust Him in His Word. Millie Graham, you see, had moved from saying, I will trust my 30,000 troops and God. I will trust my brilliance, my intellect, modern thinkers, and the Word of God to saying, I will trust the, 3, 000, the 300 troops God sent me in with, and I will trust God and His Word completely. You want God's power in your life? Are you, what is your and statement? I will trust God and. I will trust God's word and my rationalization. I will trust God's power and my financial plan. Oh, I'll trust God's power and God's word unless it doesn't make sense with my financial plan and then I can't trust God. I'll trust God's power and his word and my ability to make the Bible socially acceptable. How many of us how many Christians in churches today lack the power of God because you are afraid the Bible is going to make somebody uncomfortable in this generation? You're not really trusting the power of God and His Word. I'll trust the power of God in my personality and my abilities. Jeremiah 17, 5, the arm of the flesh will fail you. God is saying, you want to trust your power? Trust your power. You want my power? Depend on me completely. Like Billy Graham, what would it take for you to fully surrender, to surrender the full weight of your heart and life to the trustworthiness of God and His Word? So you're living not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. How many times have you said, God, I can't do this, can't accept Here's the question. What are you trusting more? God's calling on your life to obey or your strength? God's call to obey always trumps our abilities. That's what it means to trust His power. I can't serve because I just don't have time. I know God wants me to. I don't have time to read the Bible and to pray. I know God wants me to, but I just don't have time. So you, you rationalize why it's okay. I can't really tithe and put God first with my money. 2% of people that go to, of Christians tithe, by the way. Is it any wonder there's no revival? I'm going to trust God, but I'm going to trust my financial plan more but the arm of the flesh fails us. When was the last time? Can you remember a time in your life when you believed nothing is impossible with God? When was the last time you really believed nothing's impossible with God? If God's called me to obey, He'll give me the power to obey. That's what it means to be desperate for His power. I'll trust him alone. 
When was the last time you faced an unbeatable foe, your Midianites, your demon-possessed boy, really believing God doesn't need my strength? God doesn't need my ability to think this one through, to rationalize it, to make sense of it. I need to obey. I need to trust. And then we experience his power. I've shared with you the story before. I love it of the young Chinese man, 20 years old probably. He'd only been a Christian for like less than six months. He went to a training given by uh, Curtis Sargent in, uh, in one of the provinces there in China about how to share your faith. And after the week, Curtis did what he often did. He, he, would, he made, had this handmade, had hand-drawn map outlining the, the counties and the towns. And then he said to everybody that he had trained, who will go... There are millions and millions of people living in this area who've never heard the gospel of Jesus once. Who will take the gospel to these people? Immediately, this 20-year-old boy raised his hand. He said, I'll go. Curtis said, how? How will you do this? And he said, the boy lifted up his Bible and he said, with God's word in my hand and his Holy Spirit to empower me and his love for lost people in my heart. I have all I need to go to the next town and to reach my family and my friends with the good news of Jesus Christ and to start a church and to make disciples. Now, how many of you think he made no mistakes? How many of you think when he asked, was asked questions, he had all the answers? How many of you think he experienced the power of God? because he was willing to obey. He went, not by might, not by power, but with his whole weight of faith fully dependent on the Spirit of God. Here's the best part of that story for me. That story was told to me by Bill Smith, who was there. And, um, and I asked Curtis Sargent when I saw him in the last year, I said, Curtis, tell me the story of the guy in the Hainan conference, uh, 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 province that you trained. And at the end of the training, you, he said he would go take the gospel. And you asked him how. And he said, with the God's word in my hand and, and you know, the power, Holy Spirit in my heart and the love of God for lost people, I have all I need to go reach the lost. <laughs> tell me that story in your words. He thought for a moment and kind of got this distant look on, in his eyes. And I thought, did Bill Smith make up a story, you know, and just kind of give me a story? And Curtis said this. He said, Brett, in the last 20 years, that kind of thing has happened so much in my training in China. I can't tell you one story because there are too many. I was convicted. Because I thought, what kind of, what kind of Christians are we producing at New Life? I don't have one story like that, let alone so many that I forget. Are we a people who say, once I get my 30,000 troops in order, then I'll go, then I'll make a difference? Or are we a people who say, I don't need my 30,000 troops, Jesus doesn't need my 30,000 troops, I need Jesus. He has called me, I will obey. I need his word, I need his Holy Spirit, and that is enough for me. His power is made perfect in my weakness, and I will go. I will serve. I will sacrifice. We are so used to measuring ourselves by the world. The way the world's, oh, you got to be balanced in life. Oh, you can't make, you may be afraid you're going to burn out kind of thing. Do you think the Apostle Paul talked like that? think Gideon did. I will go and make disciples and sacrifice and take a stand for Christ, trusting in his power. And will we make mistakes? Yes, we will. And will we sometimes look like failures and fools in the eyes of the world? Yes, we will. And we will look like glory to God. And his power will be at work within us. Who make the best disciples for Christ? Desperate disciples desperate because we are driven by his holiness and we completely rely on his power. <laughs> and when you completely rely on God's power, you got to, yeah, that's desperate. 
Charles Wesley one time said, give me a hundred people who, who love God and nothing else. A hundred people who hate sin and nothing else. The holiness of God driven by. He says, and I'll change the world. We have more than a hundred here. I hope you join us. I hope that describes you. Heavenly Father, we are desperate for you. God, I confess that there are lots of times that I theoretically like the idea of your holiness, but I'm not desperate for it. That I'm actually quite content in being neighbors with sin. Um, Lord, I pray that you would make us your people. There's a work in this room that only the Holy Spirit can do. I thank you that your word and your word is living and active and we trust that you will work through your word. We trust that you will work through your Holy Spirit and may every change that takes place today in this room, every next step be because people are listening to your voice, the compelling of your Holy Spirit, trusting in you and your power alone. And Lord, would you, sh would you just take us where you would have us to go? Through Jesus, I pray. Amen.